Okay, so in the previous video we talked about filter methods for feature selection, where the filter methods are based on the properties of the features. Now there are two different ways of doing feature selection or two different categories, the embedded methods and the wrapper methods, which both involve a model like a classifier. So for, the, for now we are going to talk about these embedded methods, which have the feature selection implicitly happening as part of the model training or let's say optimization or maybe fitting, part of the model fitting. And how that works uh, we will see in this video in the context of L1 regularized logistic regression. And in the next video we will talk about decision trees and random forests and how the yeah, implicit feature selection happens there. So again, just for context, we are still talking about dimensionality reduction and in particular feature selection and these embedded methods for feature selection. And the focus of this video is L1 regularization, which is also sometimes known as lasso, if you have heard about this from other classes before. I know we haven't really talked about logistic regression in this class yeah, explicitly. I only shared with you uh, a chapter and also some uh, yeah, recordings from my deep learning class. Um, also, we don't really have to talk about logistic regression in detail for this video. I don't want to get, let's say, too sidetracked because otherwise this video will be easily an hour long. Um, so only the basics here. So um, here in this example, I'm showing you a binary logistic regression model where we have two classes from the iris data set with two features, the petal length and the petal width. And one thing to see here is that a yeah, logistic regression produces a linear decision boundary to separate these two classes. So the decision boundary is actually based on applying a threshold to the weighted sum of the inputs, which are also yeah going through a nonlinear transformation function. Okay, this sounds maybe a little bit complicated, so I have actually a figure here summarizing all of it. So this would be a logistic regression model. And um, starting on the left-hand side here, we have the weights. So actually we can have up to M weights where M is the dimensionality of our data set. In the previous slide, I showed you this binary case where we have two classes, but also only two features. So the two features, we can call them X1 and X2, the petal length and the petal width here. And then we can, for simplicity, let's say ignore um, the other features. And um, for each feature, there is a weight parameter. So here W1 and W2, and the weight corresponds to the input. And then we also have this B here, which is a so-called bias unit. So it's called bias unit. And you can think of it like more like an intercept term. So using these types of information, we compute a weighted sum. So you can think of it as uh, let's say um, wj times xj, where the sum is over j, the input features, the number of features, and then yeah, the bias term gets added to it. So this would be our weighted sum, which goes through a nonlinear transformation function. Here it's a sigmoidal function. It's sometimes also called the logistic sigmoid. We don't have to dive into too many details here, but one thing I can tell you is that this is outputting a value between 0 and 1, and this can be interpreted as a class membership probability um, that denotes yeah, the probability that a certain data point belongs to class 1, given, yeah, given the observed features. And then we can apply a threshold function, and if the value, so here the value between 0 and 1 is, let's say, greater than 0.5, if it's greater than 0.5, oops, we may output class 1. And if it's, let's say, smaller or equal to 0.5, we can output class 0. And this is how it makes the, the class label prediction, the binary prediction that we've seen in the previous slide. Okay, so that's just like <laughs> logistic regression in a, in a nutshell. And um, one aspect about it is that how logistic regression learns the weights is by looking at the prediction and comparing it 
to the true label. And based on that, it, for example, computes the derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights and then update the weights. So um, that sounds maybe super complicated, but um, maybe if it helps, think about linear regression. In linear regression, we have a simple loss function where we have the mean squared error. So we have in linear regression, the mean squared error is the difference between the true value and the value we want to, or the value that the model predict, let's call that y hat for each data point i, and then we compare, uh, compute the um, the square of that so that the values can't be negative. So we are essentially measuring how far are we off. So it's just like a measure of error. And then if this is our loss function, we compute the derivative of the loss with respect to the weights to find out how much do we have to change the weights to update or to minimize the loss function. That's the, the main idea. But again, we don't want to have like a super detailed le lesson here on gradient descent or optimization and these types of things. The bottom line is that we have a loss function that we want to minimize in logistic regression. And how that works, let's say that's just some black box, it's just minimizing this loss function where the loss function, uh, the loss is just a measure of, of error here. In logistic regression, the loss function looks relatively complicated. It's actually not super complicated. I can share with you um, yeah, the lectures I have on logistic regression. Um, it's actually uh, just maximum likelihood, but it looks, if we have no explanation here, it looks probably super complicated to you. But again, like I said, don't worry about it at this point. Uh, you can just think of it, of it like as mean squared error or something like that. It's just like a way of measuring the error here. Um, the interesting part is that comes now to the feature selection is this L1 norm here. So the L1 norm is a measure of how big the weights are. So this is like the shorthand for it. And here is like, it's more like verbose, where we have a sum over the m different weights in our model, where m is the number of features in the data set. And we're looking at the absolute size, the magnitude of the weights. We're summing up the magnitude. Here, this is just the vector notation. And um, lambda is, you can think of it as a scaling factor. And that's essentially a hyperparameter that we have to tune when we use this in practice. So the the central part is really just that this is a weighted sum of the sizes of the weights. So we have two things. We have now a loss function. That is the regular loss function in um, logistic regression. And we have the so-called L1 norm or L1 penalty term, which is in linear regression, also sometimes called, I mean, the original model is actually called LASSO, which stands for Least Absolute Shrinkage and Selection Operator. Why am I telling you about this? <laughs> so um, when we want to use this, or when we want to think about this embedded feature selection approach, we actually add this penalty to the loss function. We can think of it as a penalty against complexity because we can think of it of, about it like this. If we have large weights, larger weights, because we compute the weighted sum, give a high or make the features matter a lot when we talk about the weighted sum and compute the threshold. So a large weight gives a feature a lo lot of importance. So a model with very large weights is very sensitive to small changes in the input. So we can think of it as a complex model in that, when, in that sense. So we can think of this whole penalty term as a penalty against complexity when we add it to the loss function. So this is what I'm showing you here at the bottom. So at the bottom we are adding this penalty term to the loss function and just for reference again, the loss function here is something we want to minimize. Actually we want to minimize the whole loss function here, that is part of the objective. But now this one adds a positive value, a large value, a value that is greater than zero, right? As long as the weights are greater than zero. But if we want to minimize the loss, this minimization procedure will try to keep these weights 
small, right? Because only if you have small weights, you minimize or you get a smaller loss. So the loss tries to find weights that are good for making predictions. And at the same time, we want to find small weights, as small as possible, given that we still make a good prediction. It's maybe hard to think about it like this, so there is actually a nice geometric intuition. And for more details, I recommend uh, the lecture notes here by uh, Ryan Tipshirani and Larry Wasserman, which have like more the mathematical details described. Here we are more looking at the visual um, concept. So here this is summarizing this um, dual objective that we have now, this kind of like constraint optimization. So what we have here, think about again at the first, about this first slide I showed you, the decision boundary. The, I can maybe go back here. This slide where we have two features. So if we have two features, we have two weights. We have a weight W1 for this feature and W2 for that feature. And then we will found, want to find this uh, weighted sum and boundary, where we want to find essentially the weights such that we make a good prediction. And if we make a good prediction, this minimizes the loss. And here, these con contour lines, let's say, shall represent the magnitude of that loss. And the more, so the outer ones are a large, corresponding to a large loss, and the ones um, more in the center correspond to a smaller loss. It's really like just a contour plot. And let's just say this one is the global loss minimum without the regularization term. So it's just this loss here in, in the center. It's the regular logistic regression loss. And it's mi minimized if we find weights, W1 and W2, that are this big here, like when we look at what the corresponding values on these axes would be. Okay, so this is just about minimizing the loss. We want to find weight values such that we have them, we minimize this loss function. Now going back one more time. So uh, now here we have this penalty term and we know this is minimized if the weights are zero, right? Because only if the weights are zero, the sum can be zero. So this sum here. So what that means, if we think about the penalty term, that's the global, it's the global minimum of that penalty term. But we have now two things, right? We have the loss function plus the penalty term. So what we want is somewhere, let's say, between those two, between minimizing the global loss minimum and minimizing the global penalty minimum. And it just so happens that in L1 regularized, logistic regression with this L1 penalty, if we have a large enough, let's say, lambda term, it happens that the solution, the trade-off between minimizing the global loss and minimizing this penalty term lies somewhere where one of the weights is zero, or well, usually more than one weight can be zero. Sometimes people also call that sparse weights if we have more than half of the weights zero. But yeah, it just has a chance if we use L1 that this is likely to have one of the weights zero. And again, for mathematical details, uh, you're encouraged to check out yeah these lecture notes here. Okay, so this was a conceptual overview, but I also want to show you an applied example of that in practice. So for this example, we are going to use the wine data set. Why the wine data set? It has a few more features than iris, so it's a little bit more interesting to look at um, lasso or L1 penalties as feature selection. So we have three classes here. Uh, we earlier said it's uh, logistic regression is for binary classification, but we can also extend it to multi-class settings. I will talk about this later. And also my deep learning lecture has an example of multinomial logistic regression for explaining that if you are interested. Um, here, it's really the focus is on the features. So we have different features. I think there are 13 different features from the alcohol content to the proline content of different wines. And the, yeah, the classification task is to distinguish between different uh, types of wine. 
I think it's actually grapes, but I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> okay, um, by the way, I also have all the code examples nicely organized in a notebook, which I will also share below the video so you can play around with it a little bit yourself. Because I'm skipping over, let's say, the data loading step and stuff like that. But it's all in the notebook if you want to toy around with that. So starting how we start with any data set <laughs> when we do machine learning in scikit-learn, we split the data into a training and a test set. Usually we also have a validation set or we use cross-validation, but for simplicity, let's say we just have a training and a test set here. And we are also standardizing the features. Again, I'm not explaining how standardization works because we have done that many, many times in this class. And I don't want to make these videos too long by repeating all these things. Okay, so the main part here is now using the logistic regression model. So first of all, note that we set the L1 penalty here. But one downside is if we set an L1 penalty that we want to use, we have to also use a different solver. So it's like an unnecessary detail maybe, but the solver is essentially the way or the function or approach to minimize the loss function. There are different ways. I mean, gradient ascent, Newton, uh, conjugate gradients, um, this lip linear library, which is um, another yeah, implementation of kind of like a gradient descent based um, method. So in that sense, um, there are different ways we can optimize the loss. It's just like a maybe unnecessary detail, but we have to choose something other than the default value if we want to use a L1 penalty. Oops. And um, another thing here is that we have this multi-class setting here because we have more than two classes now. By default, again, it uses something called multinomial logistic regression, but I wanted to be here explicit also because for the lip linear it uses, I think, the one versus rest regression. I'm just being explicit here. And one versus rest um, logistic regression is essentially yeah, an extension of logistic regression to multi-class settings where we have multiple logistic regression models. It might sound super complicated at this point, but it's actually in the concept is similar to the um, average per class accuracy that we discussed a few weeks ago. And in particular, what we do is, if we have three classes here, we, th we fit three logistic regression models. So we fit one logistic regression model for class one versus rest, where rest is class 2 and 3, then class 2 versus rest, where rest is now class 1 and th one and 3, and then class 3 versus rest, where rest is now class 1 and 2. So we have three models. And correspondingly, we also have three bias units. So intercept is the bias unit, it's just a different word for that. So because, if I go back a few slides, We've seen before we have only one bias unit, but because we have three um, logistic regression models with this one versus rest approach, we have now, oops, we have now also three, um, three bias units. And because we have three logistic regression models, we also have three sets of weights. So one set corresponds to the first model, one set corresponds to the second model, and one set corresponds to the third model. We don't need to discuss all these models, it's essentially just as um, just like having multiple regression models here. And then let's just focus on the first one here for one versus rest classification, so one versus the other classes. And what's interesting here is, first of all, that gives us the weight coefficients. And the magnitude of these weights tell us also how important each feature is. Because in the weighted sum, the feature is multiplied with the weight. So the larger the weight, the more contribution that feature has to the weighted sum, and then also to coming up with a class label. And then we can see that some of these features are actually zero. And this is now finally the feature selection step, yay. So it's basically that we eliminate certain features so that only some features remain. And we can think of that really as feature selection here. Um, and related to that, why are there these particular ones selected? I mean, it, it depends on how strong we set the regularization strength that we had this parameter lambda. Here, in this context, there is no lambda, there is this C parameter. 
and c is the inverse of lambda. Why is it c? I think it's because of support vector machines that um, a certain implementation has this parameter c. Lambda in logistic regression is more popular, but I think the developers of scikit-learn wanted to keep things um, consistent in the API, so c is used everywhere, and c is the inverse regularization strength, so that means a small c has or corresponds to a large lambda, so small c is large regularization, and a large c is small regularization. And I encourage you to play around with lambda, and you will see the smaller you make c, the larger the penalty will be and the more zeros you will observe. Vice versa, the larger you make c, the weaker the regularization will be because it's the inverse of lambda. So the larger you make c, the less zeros you will see and the larger the weights will become. Okay, and playing around with that is actually a good exercise, but there is, let's say, a more visual approach to that, and it's called a lasso path. And I also have this as an example in the code notebook that I'm sharing, so you can also take a look at that. But what I'm doing here is I'm just yeah, plotting C, the hyperparameter, over the weight coefficient. So I'm just comparing what is the size of the weights for different regularization strengths. Where this is um, strong, uh, sorry, this is the other way around. This is weak, and this is um, strong regularization because it's the inverse. And you can see if we have weak regularization, so these colors correspond to all the feature values in the data set, where here I'm showing you the weights, but the weights correspond, of course, to the features. And you can see if I have a weak regularization, you have relatively large uh, feature weights, and you can also deduce if you have a standardized data set that, let's say, these are the most important features, the prolines and uh, color intensity, because they have the largest weight, so they contribute more to the decision, to the class prediction. And you can see as we increase the regularization strength, these features approach zero, and some of them actually get then also eliminated earlier than others. And yeah, you can think of it as a sort of feature selection. Of course, we can't really yeah, steer it in the way that we can't say, okay, I want to select exactly five features or something like that. That's not how it works, but you can play around with um, C and yeah, just eliminate features that way that you have a sort of feature selection by eliminate, eliminating, fe eliminating features that are not good for the objective function of uh, logistic regression. Or in another sense, Logistic regression will find features that, um, or will keep only the features that are good for making good predictions. So in that sense, it's like an embedded, an internal, implicit way of selecting features. And um, yeah, also we can think about the size of the weights as um, feature importance. And we will actually also revisit this later when we talk about a wrapper method called recursive feature elimination. But yeah, this should be it for now, talking about L1 regularized logistic regression. And in the next video, we will talk about embedded methods in the context of decision trees and random forests.